Well, today we're going to continue on our series on prophecy, see some of the things that are really critical to understanding prophecy, and we're going to be looking at uh, scripturally uh, a number of things throughout the Bible that are the key to understanding all prophecy. You can see a chart here behind me uh, that uh, deals with some of these things. It's also available, I think, on our website. You can download it in a PDF or um, JPEG file and, and look at it as well. It's an important one for you to see, and uh, it has a, a lot of information on it. And this chart, of course, is uh, an overview scripturally of of what the whole Bible says regarding God's plan of the ages. And the whole principle of this chart is to show that God had in place before the foundation of the world, before the creation of the first creation, he had another creation in his plan. And that new creation, of course, is a new creation in the promised one. So that's very much a part of all of this and uh, understanding these things. There's an enormous amount of information on this chart and uh, it's a lifetime in putting it together, but we bring it to you as a resource for you to use and um, for you to be able to have it available to you. Now, there are a number of other things that are available for you as well. We do have of course, the chart of uh, the dispensations, the chart of the tribulation. We have this background available as well uh, for you uh, to see and uh, to understand. Those charts are available online. Uh, and all of these things are, are provided to give you a depth of understanding of what the Word of God says. So we're looking at all of these things from the perspective of the scriptures and, and what God is going to do. So we're looking at a number of things here as well in uh, the scriptures and seeing um, what God is doing. So some of this is uh, pretty uh, involved, pretty detailed. Um, my doctoral dissertation is actually on prophecy, on the book of Revelation, 270,000 word dissertation on this. Uh, and uh, of course that is available online if you want to order that even p either in PDF or printed form. But uh, these are some pretty important things for us. So we have this chart that is available, which is the key to understanding all prophecy. And then we have this dispensational chart, which is available. Also gives you an overview of seven, uh, the seven dispensations of God. And uh, of course, all of this is very much a critical part for your understanding of what God is doing. So God's eternal plan began with Jesus Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's Revelation 13:8. That happened before time, space, or matter were ever created. And the eternal, self-existing Son of God, the third person of the triune Godhead, was elected, chosen, to become the Messiah, Redeemer, the Christ of God. And one day in history, that's a physical actuality, to be born into humanity and into the human predicament of sin, to become a new federal head, the firstborn of the new Genesis in Jesus Christ. And that is that overview of, uh, of all that's there in the new Genesis in Jesus Christ. So we start off here with seeing that prophecy uh, is not about guessing what might happen at some unknown point in the unfolding of the history of the world. Neither is prophecy about predicting the future, as some people think. We're not predicting anything. Prophecy is God revealing something he knows will happen in the future with varying degrees of detail of that future event. 
We're not given all the details, but we're given a great deal of it. And in most cases, the details of history, uh, of prophecy, which is foretold history, are expanded through progressive revelations. Prophecy is about the same thing revealed through different people at different times in history with added details. This is known as an inductive uh, methodology. So we find the first prophecy in, in the scriptures found in Genesis 3.15. And uh, this is, of course, a very important, simple portion of scripture. But this prophecy is often referred to as the protevangelium. And it simply means the first promise, or the first prophecy, the first promise of God in the Bible. It's a prophetic promise. So Genesis 3.15 speaks of the promised one. And it speaks of the promised one in the seed of the woman. And of course, in Genesis 3.15, is the all-encompassing prophetic statement upon which all other prophecies build. If you don't understand this prophecy, you can't. This is a key. This is, every other prophecy builds upon this one. What is an expansion of this prophecy? In verse 14, it says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all the cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and the dust shalt thou eat all the days of the life. And then verse 15, he says, I will put enmity, essentially warfare, between thee and the woman, between thy seed. Now, this is an expansion of this enmity, the seed of corruption, which is the uh, in fallen mankind, passed through the, the seed of man, beginning with Adam, and her seed. This is referring to the promised one, born through a woman without the seed of a man. Uh, Eve didn't have the seed of Adam. And so uh, this is referring to the incarnation of Jehovah in Messiah, who was called Jesus. And so it shall bruise crush Satan's head. That is the seed of the woman. That is the Messiah, the promised one. He shall crush Satan's head. And that is dominion. Satan took dominion over the world. He became the prince and power of the air, the god of this world. And uh, so he, the, the seed of the woman would crush that dominion. But Satan, thou shalt bruise his, the promised redeemer's heel. He couldn't hold him in the grave. Death couldn't hold him. And so uh, this is a, a very important part of biblical prophecy and something if you're going to understand prophecy, you have to understand all of these things. God has intended an order of sovereignty within creation. And understand this, you have, this is understanding, this is understanding redemption. God is the supreme sovereignty in all matters and all, has always retained that sovereignty. When God said to Adam, don't eat of this tree, he retained the sovereignty over Adam, even though he had given Adam dominion over the creation. So God retained sovereignty. But the second level of sovereignty was given to Adam shortly after the creation. Adam was given dominion or sovereignty over all of God's creation, including dominion, dominion over angels, which are also created beings as well. Now, he, some of those angels didn't like that, and they rebelled against it. And although angels were created to be the servants of God within creation, they were also created to be the servants of humanity. And Satan rebelled against this divine order of God's sovereignty. Now, he deceived Eve, corrupted mankind with Adam's willful disobedience to God's sovereign command. And we're told that, of course, in, in Genesis chapter 2, in verse 16 through 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. That's God's sovereignty, retaining God's sovereignty over Adam. 
For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And of course, that's spiritual death. Adam didn't die physically yet. We died, you know, almost a thousand years later physically, but he did die spiritually that moment. So there are several verses of Scripture that give us keys to understanding all prophecy. Uh, and of course, from the Word of God. One of the most important keys in Scripture for understanding all prophecy is found in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. And here it says, all, uh, all that dwell upon the earth, that's during the seven-year tribulation, shall worship him. That's the Antichrist. And, and, and then it clarifies that, whose names are not written in the book of life. Otherwise, uh, the lost will worship him. Unsaved people will not. Uh, who's, the, those whose names are written in the, in the book of life won't. But what book of life is? That's a lamb slain from where? The foundation of the world. So Christ, uh, the promised Christ, uh, even though bef Adam had not yet sinned, before God ever laid the foundation of the world, before God ever created Adam and Eve, he had in place a plan for a new Genesis. And Christ the only way to usher in that new genesis to restore lost dominion that Adam would lose uh, and lost souls that Adam would lose and, and, and continue to propagate uh, sin nature through man, two folds of redemption would be put into place. That's a key to this understanding all of this. So before God could uh, ever created the creation recorded in Genesis 1 and 2, God, God had another creation in plan. And uh, this other creation is referred to in the scripture as the regeneration. Now, we can see that from uh, other portions of scripture that are, are pretty uh, critical for us to understand. And of course, one of those portions of scripture is found in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 19, and verses 27 through 30. Now, that's a very important portion of scripture for us to understand because Peter and Christ are having a conversation about this. And in verse 27 it says, And then Peter, uh, then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have, all, we have forsaken all and follow thee. What shall we have therefore? Of course, Peter is still preoccupied with the things of this earth and reign and rule with Christ in the kingdom, a kingdom on earth. That is, of course, what uh, the Jewish people were thinking when they thought of the Messiah coming. And then Jesus says to him, and Jesus said unto them, now this is to all the others. Peter asked a question that all the other apostles uh, and disciples are listening and Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, when that takes place, that's, that's of course on the kingdom age, ye, that's the twelve apostles, also shall sit upon twelve thrones, that's in their glorified bodies. They're going to rule the kingdom, directly under Jesus Christ on their own 12 thrones. There'll be others, of course, uh, who will rule underneath those 12 thrones, but there is a order of sovereignty established, going to be established in the kingdom. Those who are faithful, they'll be given other places to rule underneath the 12 apostles. But they are going to rule, and they're going to set, and these 12 apostles uh, also set on 12 thrones, in their glorified bodies, in the kingdom age, and they're going to be judging the 12 tribes of Israel during the kingdom age. Now, judging is essentially ruling. Jesus has promised that the church age believers will be, uh, he'll be the king of kings and lords, uh, lord of lords. He's going to be, we're going to be the kings of which he is king and the lords of which he is lord. So judging the 12 tribes of the kingdom, uh, of, uh, of the tribes of Israel during the kingdom age. They'll, they'll be restored. Of course, remember we have 12,000 of each of those 12 tribes sealed during the mid-trib 
and they will return to earth in glorified bodies. The sealing takes place in heaven. And they'll come and be witnesses to the Jews during the tribulation time. And there'll be, the, of course, the numbers of, from the sands of the sea, from all nations and tribes, one to Christ. So in verse 29, he says, And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake, that's referring to all faithful believers during the church age. Every one shall receive a hundredfold of what they sacrificed and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first, of course, that's saved Jews that died prior to Pentecost. Even though they are first, they shall be last in the kingdom age. They won't have a ruling power. They won't be uh, in the order of the rule, of the sovereignty of God. They're going to be the least. And the last, that's faithful Jews and Gentiles saved and alive after Pentecost, that are raptured and are faithful, they shall be first in the order of sovereignty in the kingdom age. So all of these things <laughs> become pretty important when we think about what it means to be faithful during the kingdom age. Now, What's, what, what does it mean by this word regeneration here? Uh, first of all, it is from, uh, it's translated from a Greek word, paleogenesia. And it's a construction, literally, of two Greek words. First word is palin. It means again or once more. The second Greek word is a word we're all familiar with. It's genesis meaning generation or creation. So the meaning of regeneration is simply, again, Genesis or new creation. You know, Paul speaks of that extensively in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or new creation. So the fall of Adam and the curse of God upon the first creation in time resulted in two kingdoms. And we understand, of course, this is another important part of understanding prophecy. God retains sovereignty, that's a judicial term, uh, otherwise the absolute authority and right to govern with even the power of life and death. God retains sovereignty over both of these kingdoms. Now the preeminent kingdom, the primary kingdom, is the kingdom of God. And you see a chart here that details this kingdom of God. Now, God gave dominion of the first creation in time to Adam. And this is what God, God's word refers to as the kingdom of heaven. And this is a little different. Uh, this is, uh, in, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And so when Adam chose to disobey God, he relinquished the dominion of the first creation in time to Satan, and Satan became the god of this world, the prince and power of this air. So the whole of this first creation in time was cursed of God, is destined for complete destruction, dissolution, and to be destroyed with fire. So we have to understand these two things. God's sovereignty is retained in the first creation. And we have to understand this, the kingdom of God before the fall. And this continues throughout time. This is the supreme sovereignty. Then we have God giving a sovereignty of man, but yet he retains sovereignty even over the creation in the fall. So all of these are important to understanding uh, biblical prophecy and what God is doing. Since the fall of mankind into sin and condemnation through Adam, through his willful act of rebellion against God's will, God has been moving forward through history with the twofold plan of redemption. And all prophecy, all prophecy hinges on these two purposes. So if you understand these two purposes, it helps you to understand what God is doing within the context of prophecy, what God is uh, revealing through it all. The first one, of course, is the redemption of lost mankind. He's, he's seeking to save souls. In his 
seeking to save souls through the process of, re of the regeneration. Of course, they have to have an event of salvation whereby they're born again. Then uh, their life is saved through practical sanctification, even though their soul is always going to be saved. And then eventually their bodies will be saved in the redemption of the body. Then that's, that's a primary aspect. So you have to look at prophecy and switch, see which aspect of what God is doing in that. Then the second aspect of redemption is the redemption of mankind's lost dominion, or the world. Now, Satan, of course, is the god of this world. But when Christ died, uh, he won victory through the cross, victory over death, and he will return and take dominion over this world. Now, he hasn't done that yet. The church is not in the kingdom-building business. Christ, when he comes, will restore his kingdom, which is the dominion over this world. And that is a second aspect of redemption. Now, even though that, that's already been done positionally, it is not yet in place practically. God still retains sovereignty uh, over it all. And, uh, uh, of course, in the goal of it all and allowing time and grace to go at all, it is goal to save lost people and then ultimately restore his kingdom uh, on, on earth and restore dominion. But the entrance into the regeneration out of the dead, in th those who are dead in trespasses and sin, out of, this, uh, out of this cursed fallen creation, would, would be through the door of resurrection from the dead. That's what Jesus did. Once Christ was resurrected from the dead, he opened a door into the new Genesis, and that is a new primogeniture, a new last Adam. And when you're born again, you put your faith in Christ, you uh, thereby are born again, and by the baptism of the Spirit, removed from the first cursed creation and immersed into the new Genesis in Christ. Now, those are important terms in the Bible, and they are prophetic terms. So the central purpose of the incarnation of Jehovah into humanity, into the first uh, cursed creation, has a threefold purpose. And it's again, it's another other, under, under, important aspect of understanding uh, the keys to understanding all prophecy. First of all, uh, the incarnation is to break the bondage of death, that separation from God through reconciliation. Uh, God, the sinners can be reconciled to God through the propitiation of God, the satisfaction of his wrath, wrath and the payment of the sin penalty. That's a remission of the sin penalty. This took place through the sinless uh, substitute and the sinless obedience of the Messiah who became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The second is the substitutionary death of the sinless one that, of course, to satisfy, propitiate God's wrath upon sin in the curse. Sin still must be satisfied if God is going to be both the justifier and just. And so he has to satisfy his own wrath, his own penalty upon sin, by taking the penalty of that sin in the body of his son and paying it. That's why it's necessary to have the incarnation it just does not forgive your sin. It has to be satisfied. The wrath or the penalty upon that sin must be fat satisfied if God is to be both just and the justifier of those that believe in Christ. Third, uh, he came to crush the dominion of Satan. That's detailed there in Genesis 3.15 and opened a door into the regeneration through his resurrection out of from death, out from separation from God. And so that uh, separation from God could be, could be ended and uh, man could be reconciled to God. Now all of this is de detailed in a portion of scripture in Hebrews chapter 2. It's explained because it's, it's been so confused over the years. But this whole, there's an explanation of it in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 18. And we'll go through this as slowly as we can, but without 
getting too much bogged down in it. You can do your own studies on this and see what's here for, for you. But here, uh, God begins to explain to us the superiority, or, superiority of the new covenant in Christ, this new Genesis, over the old covenant, uh, of course, which uh, uh, could not do what the new covenant could do. So he says in verse 5, For unto the angels hath he put in subjection, uh, he hath not put into subjection the world to come. This is a sovereignty. The world to come, of course, is the new Genesis. Whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testify and saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visit him? You know, I'm trying to understand why God would go to this enormous complexity in order to redeem um, mankind. And then he talks about the fact of the incarnation in verse 7. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. This is the Messiah, the God-man. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hand. This is the restoration of dominion. Now he, Christ will claim that dominion at his second coming. coming. This is the advances on the unfolding nature of the new covenant, which is an aspect of the uh, Abrahamic covenant. He says, Thou hast put him, that thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. This is the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. For in that uh, he put all in subjection under him, uh, he hath left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not all things put under him. Otherwise, it hasn't happened yet. But we can understand from the prophetic nature of this text that that is what will happen. Everything is done for its necessity. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, his ascension, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, completes all of these. That's why Colossians 2, 2 9 and 10, or 10, and say, we're complete in him. Then verse 9, he says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. He's already seated at the right hand of God that he, by the grace of God, should test, taste death for every man, um, that literally for, for the sake of every man or everything. The concept here is, is that to restore uh, dominion, he had to taste death for everything. And so in doing so, he is a substitutionary, vicarious satisfaction of the wrath of God. And so therefore God can redeem not just lost sinners, but lost dominion. And then uh, in verse 10, he goes on and he says, For it became him, Jesus, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory. This is glorification. This is this new Genesis. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifieth and, and they who are sanctified are all of one. This is this new Genesis. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Okay, there. Uh, brethren is a concept is just as we are all one in Adam in the curse, we're all one in Christ in the new Genesis. So he says, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. This is the Lord Jesus Christ declaring the name of God. Under, the, under his brethren, in the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again I will put my trust in him, and again behold, I and the children which God hath given me. This is the new Genesis, the church of the firstborn. And this is the whole primogeniture of the new Genesis beginning in Jesus Christ. Then, of course, he goes on in verse 14. He's not done yet. And he says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same. He can't deliver us into a new primogeniture unless he becomes like us. And so he became flesh. He became a man so that he could deliver us through redemption into a new genesis and then take dominion, restore dominion that was lost and, of course, and bind Satan through it all. 
eventually going to judge Satan as well. He's already judged, but that's not practically done until he is cast into the lake of fire. Uh, and then he says, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That, that is the devil. He'll destroy him too. That's going to happen. That's not completely uh, finished yet, but positionally it's all done. And then, and, then, and, then, and then it goes on verse 15, And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He's going to deliver them through glorification, resurrection, translation, glorification into this new Genesis. And we're not going to be any longer in subject to this bondage uh, to death or even to sin. Verse 16, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Now remember in Genesis 3.16, or not Genesis, Galatians 3.16, Paul explains there, not the seed as of many, which is, but the seed as of one, which seed is Christ. That seed of Abraham was a concept of faith. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation or propitiation for the sins of the people. That's what he did. He, he made propitiation. He satisfied God's wrath for the sins of whosoever will believe in him. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor, to, to aid, to relieve. The idea is that of support during oppression and intent upon deliverance from that oppression. He's able to do that for them that are tempted. And of course, that's the weakness of our flesh. So he's there for us in all of these concepts, both in our salvation and throughout our lives. The concept of deliverance here is not just deliverance from the condemnation of sin, but from the power of sin and the indwelling of Holy Spirit as we learn to yield to uh, Christ in us. And that, of course, is Romans 6, 11 through 13. So these two streams of redemption are the subject matter of Hebrews 2, 5 through 18. And these two streams of redemption are found together in Hebrews 2, 9 in the phrase, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for, or for the sake of, every man or everything important portions of scripture for us if we understand them from all that they have to say. Now, there has been some considerable debate, debate regarding the meaning of the Greek word pas, translated every man in Hebrews 2.9. It, it simply means every all or the whole. It could be translated whatsoever or whosoever, depending on the context. And I believe the context, along with an inductive application of the scripture gives us a much stronger support for translating pas as everything, as it refers to the whole of God's creation or the whole world. John 3, 16, for, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the efficacy of the sacrifice of Christ is sufficient for all but beneficial only to those who believe and receive. Now, in many cases, the teaching, preaching ministries of most local churches focus on the on one stream of God's plan of redemption. I think this is a serious failure, resulting in grave misunderstandings of many portions of Scripture and the broader ramifications of spiritual warfare within the realm of fallen creation, of which Satan is now the god of this world. I think we have to be careful about these things. We need to be more uh, careful about what we say and, and our explanations. But this corruption of God's original uh, intent uh, cannot be allowed to continue. We're not going to rebuild what has been cursed and fallen by some idea, ideology or some utopian society. That's not going to happen. Christ is going to restore this. He's done it, redemption of the soul and the redemption of, uh, of dominion when he, he takes order. But he's still going to destroy this first creation. 
the incarnation of God in human flesh in the body of Jesus, his holy life, his substitutionary death, his burial, his resurrection, his return in glory are all critical truths to the completion and provision of these two streams of redemption. And we have to understand those things. If you're going to understand prophecy, you have to understand these keys. So above and beyond these two streams of redemption lies a much higher purpose in the salvation of souls and the restoration of God's original order of sovereignty. The primary purpose in all of this is to glorify God in all his wondrous attributes. So therefore, the primary purpose of both streams of redemption is so that God may be known and experienced by his creation in the fullest sense of his existence and in the fullest of his glory, the revelation of himself, so that he can be fully and truly worshipped and fully appreciated by his creation in spirit and truth. John 4, 4, 4 23. If you're going to worship him, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. <laughs> That's the purpose of it all. Because Satan is dark and he's blinded our minds to these things. And he blames God for what he has done. The revelation or the glorification of the attributes of God was the central focus of the Lord's Prayer in John chapter 17. This revelation, this glorification, would be accomplished through the crucifixion, the death of Christ, through his burial, through his resurrection, through his glorification, through his return. So the glory of all of this is important, but the cross of Calvary would be a balanced manifestation of all the attributes of God in, in a single moment of time. The hate of God upon sin, the curse, and the horrors of the crucifixion and the agony of Christ on the cross and the three hours of darkness. But yet the love of God, where Christ says to the thief, today shalt, shalt thou be with me in paradise. And as a cried out to God, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There, dying for the sins of mankind that put him there. At the cross, we see both the love of God and the wrath of God. At the cross, we see both the grace of God and the judgment of God. At the cross, we see the holiness of God and God's separation from sin. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? At the cross, we see both God's transcendence and his eminence. This revelation, this glorification of the Father was and is the primary purpose of Jesus and the primary purpose of the church of Jesus Christ. This is the prayer of Christ in, in John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may what? Glorify thee, reveal thee in all of thy wondrous attributes. That's what he did on the cross. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is eternal life that they may know thee, the only true God. That's eternal life. That's the purpose of it. That they may know both the righteousness and holiness of God and know the grace and mercy and love of God. That they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And he says, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father... Glorify thou me with, my, with thine own self and with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. He's going to return there to heaven. That is the glorification of Jesus and his ascension to the Father, which happened, of course, upon his resurrection. In the incarnation, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ, his glorification, the Father's attributes revealed 
and all his sovereignty. In the resurrection and the second coming, Jesus is revealed in all his attributes and sovereignty. This revelation of Jesus Christ as a restorer of dominion and the primary genitor of, of mankind in a new genesis is really the substance of the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And if you don't understand that, you, you don't understand the keys to all prophecy. Everything else is traced right back to these truths. Everything is here found in these few portions of Scripture. Learn them and know them and share them with others. And I just pray that God bless you and use these. And thank you today for listening. And, and uh, of course, share these with as many as you can. We pray that God would bless and, and uh, use you in your discipleship of others.